Participants of Corticon 2021, uh, welcome to this session. My name is Charlie Cooper of R3, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by Jay Clayton, the former chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission here in uh, Washington, D.C., as well as a prominent lawyer and expert in finance, fintech, and everything. Jay, really great to have you. Thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's nice to be with you. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Great. Well, um, I'm going to start right at the heart of your old job, if I could. Uh, over the last several weeks and several months, Gary Gensler, your successor as chairman of the SEC, has been pretty vocal in his concerns um, and made some cautionary comments about crypto, about decentralized finance, uh, even about stable coins. And many of those comments have been echoed by the acting chair of the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, as well as President Biden's nominee to replace the acting chair at the OCC. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, maybe this, this shift, as it appears to be a shift in greater regulatory scrutiny, what it might pretend in the future, and wh what you think the SEC might be thinking and up to next. Well, well, Charlie, I, there's, a, there's a lot in there, and um, let, let, me, let me address a few things. I, I'm not sure that we should call this a shift. Um, you know, obviously, whenever there's a change in administration, uh, change in leadership at agencies and the like. There are questions about which way people will tack or not. And as it becomes clear where people are going, um, you say, oh, there's been a shift or there's been a change in direction. Um, you know, in the, in the area of, uh, let's just call it crypto application to financial services, financial products and the like, I, I do believe that the broad themes are the same. And that is what function is the particular crypto product, crypto asset, um, code, what function is it performing? Map that to the incumbent product, code, whatever you want to call it, and are the same protections there from a regulatory perspective? And whether that's prudential regulation, um, you know, system integrity, or consumer and investor protection, that at the heart of it is what uh, our regulatory system is trying to do. And I think that is what uh, Chair Gensler is, is, is out there uh, talking about, um, as well as uh, many of the others. But with that broad uh, perspective, let me let you follow up with me on it. Well, actually, so, so that is interesting uh, for about a million reasons. But one of the things that jumped out at me there is if we're talking about what the application is, what the particular instrument does, what popped into my mind is it does it look like something that already exists just in a digitized form? Or are we seeing something wholesale different that has never been conceptualized or dealt with before? Which raises the question in my mind as to whether or not the US regulators have within their current powers, the ability to regulate and police these markets or whether or not you think there's a uh, necessity for congressional action, either on the SEC side, the CFTC side, the OCC side, et cetera, um, to give them more power to go after some of these instruments. And I, I guess it depends on which bucket it falls in. But if you could speak a little bit to that as to what Congress may or may not need to do. Well, well Charlie, I think that that is an, an excellent way to look at it. Um, take, take products. Let, let's, let's take, for example, um, a stable coin. What, what function, and there are a wide range of uh, products that are all labeled stable coins. What function is that stable coin uh, performing? Uh, in the last, uh, at, at the end of 2020, uh, we put out an interagency report on how to look at stable coins. Now, if a stable coin is backed by um, commercial paper, 30, 60, 90 day commercial paper, it sure as heck looks a lot like a money market mutual fund, a prime, you know, mutual fund, uh, uh, or, or a, you know, a prime money market fund, and probably ought to be regulated like that. If, on the other hand, um, a stable coin is is truly a stable store of U.S. dollar value, backed by cash or something that we feel as a as a regulatory system is close enough to cash that it should should be considered cash, whether that's very short dated treasuries or not, that's a that's a question. Um, it doesn't look like that. It, it may, in fact, just be a more efficient rail for the transfer of value uh, domestically and around the world. So those, those are two things that you can look at. Now, 
Um, let's move away from that, you know, a, a mechanism for payment or a short-term, um, you know, investment vehicle, which we both know about, to the tokenization of things that previously um, people had a hard time participating in, retail people had a hard time participating in, and whether that's, you know, art, NFTs, other things, there, um, a whole new sort of world opening up for re potential retail investment. We, we need to look at whether, um, to the extent they're not securities, and you know, we can get into some of those debates about that kind of thing, there is need for, for uh, additional regulation to protect retail investors and the consumer. Look, retail investor protection, consumer protection has sort of been at the heart of finance um, for a long time in this country. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm chuckling when you mentioned securities. Uh, it's amazing that depending on the topic du jour, everybody comes an expert on everything. And I haven't practiced law in 20 years and suddenly I'm frantically trying to remember what the Howey test was. And, but I can easily go on social media and there are plenty of people who are not lawyers who've got strong opinions on what the Howey test is and how it could or cannot be applied. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I, you know, uh, I, I think Chair Gensler has actually put it well um, in that the Howey test and investment contracts are just one component uh, of an overall very broad definition of securities, which was designed to get at something quite fundamental, which is if you're pursuing a venture, you and a group of other folks are pursuing a venture and you're seeking broad financing from the public, you have an incredible information advantage about how well that venture is doing. And the, the broad definition of security was saying, once you go out to the public like that, you have to level set on that information advantage and you have to take responsibility for the information you provide. That was the basic concept that, that drove the 33 and 34 Act, both for initial financings and secondary trading. Um, and you need to start there in order to understand um, the broad application of the definition of security, not with any particular element of the, of the definition of security itself. Well, you know, I'm wondering, I'm, I'm thinking back to something you said earlier about stable coins and, and the stable coin, the term itself could have broad applicability just because the interpretation of what is a security or not, or what instruments it might apply to. And one of the things that I've been struck with on this in the stable coin debate is there seems to be a, a slight difference of opinion, or maybe not that slight between the U.S. and many of the central banks abroad. And what I mean by that is some of Chairman Powell's com, uh, comments at the Fed have indicated that the uh, best way to uh, move away from the need for a stable coin would be to issue the issuance of a central bank digital currency. <clears throat> and in his comments implied a bit that it was one or the other, that one would obviate the need for the other. And some of the conversations that we've been having in Europe with the European Central Bank and Bank of England and others, and also some in APAC, Monetary Authority, Singapore and others, seem to view a, rule for, uh, a role for both of them, that they each could play an interesting and potentially important role in the development of the new digital economy, however you want to define that. I'm wondering if, if, if you've got any thoughts in particular on what the interplay is with stable coins and the monetary system and how US and European and Asian regulators might want to think about it as, we're, as they're trying to figure out what, how to get their head around this entire new economy. Well, I think a very good place to start for, for this analysis is understanding how interconnected the various markets we're talking about are, particularly the cash market and the short-term funding markets. Um, the cash market and the, and the transfer of value um, domestically and internationally, um, you know, through our banking system and the use of, of digital entries to um, the repo um, market and, and overnight funding. You know, basically the, the repo market is how you move in and out of cash um, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with an underlying store of value in treasuries. The, the real question is how, how is all of that mechanic around the globe going to work with the introduction of this technology? That, that is the real question. And I, you know, I can see an outcome with both. We already have digital entry cash in you know, a tremendous yeah. number of places. Um, you know, the transfer between that and um, other securities, whether they be treasuries or um, you know, sovereign debt of other places and the like, how to make that more efficient 
and of course there's room for great efficiency, whether that's because the central banks introduce a digital currency that, that is um, uh, easily um, uh, exchangeable, or whether there are stable coins um, that facilitate that exchange. That is, that's the debate that's, that's playing out in the marketplace. Um, I, in these things, I, I tend to favor private innovation uh, uh, in cooperation with the government over the government going off and implementing the technology itself. Well, so the private innovation point is interesting. Uh, it's, it's particularly interesting for a company like the R3, which sits, <clears throat> excuse me, a bit at the nexus of new technologies, but really traditional financial players. We work a lot with young innovators, entrepreneurs, startups of various different shapes and sizes that are looking to get involved. They've got great ideas floating around, some of them better than others, to be fair. Um, but I often wonder when certain debates pop up as to whether or not they get the importance of policy or they understand how to navigate Washington or Brussels or London or Tokyo, et cetera, in terms of government, <clears throat> excuse me, government affairs and government relations. I, could you talk a little bit about to some of the, you know, the entrepreneurs out there, what they may want to do or some of the things they may want to take into account when they're trying to be innovative, but recognizing the role the government will play inevitably? Look, it's a, it's a great question. Let's go, let's go back to uh, facilitating better payments, more efficient payments. Sure. Um, what, it is wonderful to have a technology that takes frictions out of that system and drives value. That, that is, of course, a necessary condition um, to uh, you know, be a disruptor, come in, replace the incumbent system, provide value for everybody. Great. But it's not a sufficient condition. Whatever you're replacing is there um, and complies with existing regulation. And, and in the case of payments, let's just talk about AML, anti-money laundering, KYC, know your customer. Um, you know, uh, th that, those types of issues, unless you do it better, at least as well or better than the incumbent, you're going to have a really hard regulatory hurdle to come over. There, there's not a trade-off. Okay, lots more efficiency. We'll take a little less KYC, AML protection, that's not a viable way forward in most regulatory regimes. You have to do the KYC, AML at least as well to be able to um, capture the efficiencies. I think that's the way most regulatory systems around the globe work and should work. You should, you should not be giving up hard fought protections just to achieve efficiencies. One of the things, one of the things that we talk to when we get to innovators is they look at they look at the world of what is required of them or might be required of them. And let's take the example you just used of AML KYC. That should be, and I would agree with you, the bar. You have to get beyond that. You can't try to arbitrage and think, well, we'll give you something, but we're actually going to do less of something else. It's just, it won't float. But I think there's a lot of room or variance between the various different nations where one could launch a company, for instance. If you see China cracking down last Friday on all crypto transactions are illegal, full stop. Um, to some of the more friendly jurisdictions to crypto, we have a lot of entrepreneurs that are looking at us. And I guess the term regulatory arbitrage can be overused, but it strikes me in, in this instance that, that it matters. Do you see a parallel now between some of the stuff that was happening after 08 and 09, where different jurisdictions were moving at different paces or implementing different solutions? And is, is that bar that you talked about something that is universal, they have to get over, or, or do you think or worry or um, envision a possibility where some jurisdictions are willing to back off a bit on requirements to attract this new business, while others are willing to hold the line to ensure that some base standards exist? So one, one of the problems with these kinds of debates is I think people sort of look at it on a, on a either or two variable basis, like, you know, are we going for regulatory arbitrage to capture, you know, more business in, in say the payments or the store of value um, area than not? There's a lot more than one, there's a lot more than, you know, sort of that variable pair going on when yeah. governments have policy like this, going back to China. What, what is motivating um, uh, the recent crackdown on, uh, we'll call it crypto, but I think it's more than that in China. Yeah. And that is alternative stores of value outside of, a, a system that is heavily monitored, um, where the government has 
great insight into individual financial transactions and behavior. You know, is is that a is that a crypto issue, or is that more of a you know uh, governmental policy, social policy? Um, uh, what what going way back um, we we would we would call um, sort of money transfer controls, closed system. Is, is that is that really what's going on here? I, I, it's probably a lot of both. And and if there are these differences, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think as, um, uh, again, as someone who went through the 08, 09 crisis and trying to figure out, depending on what jurisdiction we were in, worrying about various different things, where do you think the US sits in relation to Europe or APAC, and I realize lumping those things together is sort of absurd, right? Because as soon as you get off the plane in one country in Asia, you realize how far you are from the next. And I don't just mean geographically, I mean culturally and system of government and system of monetary policy, et cetera. Where, where do you think the US is sitting? And is there anything that we in the private sector can be doing to try to encourage the right balance between regulation, but entrepreneurship and innovation? Look, I think, I think there's a common theme in the US and and, and Europe uh, across, the, uh, across the G7, which is the core of the financial system, um, needs to be extremely resilient. Uh, and we just saw that in March, April, 2020. I think if you, if you talk to central bankers and policymakers around the world, they feel very good about the additional capital requirements, um, uh, you know, the stress testing, and others and, and other prudential measures at the core of the financial system. That the fact that the core of the financial system um, did not uh, come under great stress in the face of all that uncertainty was something that people look at as, a, as quite good, quite beneficial, and we're not gonna jeopardize it going forward. So start there and understand that that's the landscape on which you're painting is a, is, is a good way to approach this. Yeah. I, I worry sometimes in, in the conversations that I have with some of these really young, excited entrepreneurs, and they're looking at these great solutions in financial services. And then when you begin to dig into their presentations a bit or their, their business pitches, things like Basel and monetary policy and questions around AML and KYC at, at financial regulators just hasn't quite sunk in. Uh, and it's almost like they're thinking technologically beyond actually the implications of what it means, what they're trying to do. Right, and, and look, we should in no way be discouraging the innovation. There's plenty of, there is plenty of opportunity in the system for greater efficiency. But let's just go back to my stablecoin example. One of the stresses in March, April, 2020, that is the focus of policymakers is money market funds. And, you know, are the rules around money market funds in terms of how much liquidity you have, stress testing, you know, whether you have gates, whether you have capital buffers, all of these sort of, I'll put all the terms to the side, they apply in the stablecoin area, particularly if stablecoins get larger. Um, regulators are gonna have the same questions about the assets underlying stablecoins as they do about the assets underlying money market. You know, if I could circle back, and I realize we're going to wrap up here pretty quickly, but if I could circle back to something we were talking about earlier, the interplay between Congress and regulators here in the United States, um, but really that model replicating abroad. Um, I do get the sense that the, the expertise in this area often sits with the regulators and the, the willingness to regulate responsibly, whatever that means, but innovate responsibly is the better way to put it, uh, sits with regulators. And I do sometimes get the sense that the, that the oversight function of Congress, the, the people that are there are trying to keep up. And it's almost like they have so many different things that they're trying to keep an eye on. The ability to understand the markets that we're talking about, which are being created in front of our very eyes, is, is something bigger, I think, than a lot of people expected. And they're a bit back on their heels. And maybe, that, maybe that's unfair. But what it does lead me to believe is that unlike a <clears throat> congressional mandate that would drive change through regulators to ensure that they regulate in a way that encourages innovation and seeks these greater efficiencies and safety in the system, et cetera, based on new technologies, that it's really the regulators that are turning back to Congress and saying, well, let me tell you what we're seeing and let me tell you what we think we need to be doing. And that in large part, Congress with the infrastructure bill and reconciliation and debt ceiling or whatever, they're just not at the point they can digest it. So in some ways they're deferring a bit to the regulators. Uh, 
but that could be a totally uh, a totally flawed understanding. I'm wondering if you, if that viewpoint makes sense and whether or not that's something that we in the private sector can do to help educate and get Congress up to speed so that they see some of the trade-offs that the regulators are trying to make. Uh, Charlie, I think you captured the dynamic incredibly well. Uh, that, that need for expertise in various er areas is you know, one of the things that came out of the New Deal and why we have agencies, whether it's the, the Securities Exchange Commission, you know, the EPA, et cetera, the idea that you would house expertise um, at independent agencies or at departments um, that Congress not, and I, I don't think the word deferral is right, but instruct. And right. what we have now is an opportunity for Congress to instruct the agencies to report to Congress as to the best way forward in these areas. And the reason I say agencies is, is the technology that we've been talking about today is not you know, isolated at the SEC or the CFTC or the Treasury or the Fed or the FDIC. It, is, it, is a, it reaches across all of those, just like lots of our past regulation reaches across those. So you know, uh, what, what, is, what is one very good way forward? which is to identify these areas and for Congress to instruct the agencies to report and deal with it so that you have that dialogue back and forth. Um, that, that, is a, that is a much better way to go forward than sort of try, each one trying to guess what the other is gonna do. Yeah. Well, I would also think there's a pretty significant role for us in the private sector to try to help the policymakers in Washington as much as we can, because if we're not dealing, down there telling our story and making the case for the innovation that we're trying to push, the case won't be made. So um, I, I could not agree more. And, and my advice, you know, it's probably worth what you're paying for it, which is nothing. Uh, but my <laughs> advice is, is to start with that perspective. Here, here, is, here is the efficiencies, the innovation, you know, the benefits for consumers that we're delivering with these products, access, lower cost, et cetera. And here's how we're doing it. It is at least as good from a consumer protection, investor protection, systemic protection, prudential point of view, as what you've got today. If, if you've got that, you know, it's hard to object. Yeah, that's great. I could not agree more. Well, thank you so much, former SEC Chairman Jay Clayton. This has been a great conversation. Uh, we're uh, looking forward to showing this to our, our viewers at Corticon and uh, hopefully tapping up again next year to see where things are then. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Great. Take care, Jay. Bye-bye.